Welcome to Rinalda Church. We are so glad that you're here. We'll start worship in just a moment. Here at Rinalda Church, we believe in doing life together. Gathering together on Sunday morning is important, but being a part of a church family has a lot more to offer. Hop on over to our website to find out all the ways you can get involved. You can check out fun activities we have lined up for our Rinalda kids, join a fun group, or catch up on our sermons you've missed. We'd also love for you to sign up for our weekly digital newsletter. Thank you for continuing to give to Rinalda Church. Giving is another way we worship God. Your gifts are what make it possible for us to grow in our church, to bless our community, and to share the gospel with the world. Give securely using the Rinalda Church app or visit the secure link on the screen. If you're visiting one of our campuses today, you can drop your gifts in the basket as it is passed or drop it by the door on your way out. Thanks so much for joining us today. Wherever you are, welcome. Let's worship together. such an honor to be with everybody. Welcome to everybody at our King Campus and at Clemens. And uh, today, everybody at 11 o'clock at the Village Campus, uh, as I am uh, have an opportunity to be at Kernersville at our brand new venue there. And a welcome to everybody joining us online. Are you ready for some good news? Beloved, you've come farther than you think. Whatever you do, don't give up now. You've made more spiritual progress, taken more territory than maybe you realize. Oh, life sometimes hits us hard and it can feel like we've been pushed back. It can take your breath away. But when you get back up, you'll realize that you have made a further progress than you realize. I want to talk to you today about a promised land principle I call Ford Progress. Last time we saw how the people of God were slaves in Egypt and they were bordered by the Red Sea and God opened it up so that they could go out of Egypt and the plan was to go through the wilderness and then enter into the promised land. But they sent 12 spies in, 10 of whom came back with a negative report, and all the people were afraid. So they turned around, and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. So their fear was, we won't be able to take the land, and we'll die in the process. The fact of the matter, though, is that the narrative makes it clear. God had given them the land, and the only way that they wouldn't take the land would be if they were too afraid to. And the only way they would die would be if they turned back and a whole generation died off in the wilderness. Forty years later, God has his men, Joshua and Caleb, two of the original spies. They're going to help lead the people into the promised land. And so what happens with the promised land is that you not only have to have courage to go into it, but what we're going to discover is that Joshua had to lead the people from battle to battle in the promised land. It was a beautiful land. It was flowing with milk and honey, and they actually entered in from the eastern side across the Jordan River. You could see in the early battles, we look at the next slide, that the, the early battles, they came in, they fought at, at, at Jericho and then uh, at Ai, and they headed south for a southern campaign. They went then later north in a military campaign and took a lot of territory. So Joshua led the people of God into the conquest of the promised land. But the thing you might not realize is that even at the end of his life, there was so much land that had not been taken. In fact, what's represented here in red is all the territory that was conquered under Joshua. All the green remained to be conquered. That was all land that God had said, this is your land and you're to have it and you're going to have it. But even during the period of the judges, they continued to have to fight battles. And it wasn't until David was on the throne that he expanded the borders of Israel until it was finally the fullness of the promised land. I put that image up there because this spiritual picture for you. 
that no matter how far you feel like you've gone in your spiritual life, it can feel overwhelming when you think only about what you have not yet done. When you think about what God's called you to, and you think about the disappointments of life, and you think about all that remains to be done, and all that you haven't reached yet, and all of the spiritual blessing that you have not yet appropriated in your life, all of the ways that you know God wants to use you, and you haven't seen it all come to pass, all the prayers that have yet to be manifestly fulfilled, all of the ways in which the wholeness that you're seeking still, you feel fractured on the inside, all of that, it can make you feel like, well, I've just, I've just, I've just failed, and I'm just not and God's not with me and I want to show you today just the opposite do not let what you have not conquered yet keep you from the joy of the progress that you've made in the Lord we're in Joshua chapter 1 and I start at verse 1 after the death of Moses the servant of the Lord the Lord said to Joshua the son of Nun Moses's assistant Moses my servant is dead Therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I'm giving to them, to the people of Israel. This is, this is Joshua's big moment because he is going to lead the people in the conquest of Canaan. And God comes to him with his big motivational speech. He needs inspiration from the Lord. He needs prophetic encouragement. He needs the power of the Holy Spirit working his right, right? And so I know as a communicator, the opening lines of any talk are some of the most important. And people decide right from the beginning, are they going to listen to you based on what the first thing comes out of your mouth? So what's the first thing out of God's mouth? He says, Moses, my servant is dead. You ever notice that God does not use the euphemisms that we use? Could he have been a little more polite here and perhaps said, uh, Joshua, I know how much you love Moses, but you know that he has gone on to glory now, or uh, he has passed from this earth, um, he has graduated. Uh, no, no, no euphemism here. He just comes and says, Moses is dead. What could possibly be encouraging about starting a speech that way? Some years ago, many years ago, I preached a series on Joshua. And I preached a whole message just on this phrase, Moses is dead. Because you know what seems particularly painful uh, in an announcement like that might actually be hidden good news to Joshua. Because Moses was was not only Joshua's mentor and spiritual father, Moses was the one who you could always count on. You know, it's just like having a dad that you could always go to. If there's a problem, we got Moses. If there's a Red Sea that needs to be crossed, we got Moses. If there's somebody needs to meet with God on the mountaintop, we got Moses. If there's somebody that needs to strike a rock and we need to get some water, we got Moses. If there's somebody that needs to help us have faith for the future, we got Moses. And all of a sudden, God comes and says, Moses who you loved, who taught you everything, your, your spiritual father, your mentor, the one who's been everything, Moses is dead. What could be good about that? Why would he start that way? Maybe it's because it is if to say the way that you came out of Egypt and the leadership of Moses that brought you there, it is now time for you to accept that is over. And Joshua... Though Moses is dead, you are not. Though Moses' gifts and his leadership was fantastic, he's gone. And there's a new day. And now you are the one. You might have a different ministry expression than Moses. It may not look that way. The entry land, the entry to any promised land of your own requires the acceptance that the means by which you got to where you are now may have to change for you to go to the next place. It is also to say, Joshua, I want you to understand now you are fully qualified for the task ahead. 
It's one of the greatest challenges in the Christian life is to believe that God could use us. We always feel like there's someone else that he could use better than he could use me. And the the opening chapter of Colossians, Paul says, you have been qualified for your inheritance in the saints. You're 100% qualified, Joshua. Moses is dead. You're not, and you are the one who's going to carry the people into the land. It means that with God, the point of remembering is not for nostalgia and sentimentality that only makes you yearn for a previous time. You don't ever see that. God doesn't ever call us to just get sentimental and have nostalgia about the past. And it's so tempting to do that. No, he, he wants us to remember so that we can have gratitude to God for what he's done and we can remember his faithfulness so that we can have confidence to move forward with him. But nostalgia, you know, it just can rob you of being able to listen and watch what God's doing now. You know, it's just weird and, and, and sad that, you know, my kids have both moved out of the house permanently now. We got our daughter, my baby girl moved up to Washington, D.C., and my wife is going through her, her old room. She said, Abby, she said, I'm thinking about cleaning out your room stuff. Do you want me to, is it okay if I throw away some stuff? Abby said, yeah, you know, I trust that we throw away. So, and every now she'll bring, come out and she'll bring some notebook or something from school. And say, look, look at this, you know. And, oh, and look, here's, here's, here's some, some memento, you know. And I mean, we're not throwing out treasures, but I mean, just, you know, clearing out things. And you just look at it and, and there's a part of, part of me that just like, Oh, that was just such wonderful times, you know, when the kids were little and they were, all of us have times that we look back to, but they're times for gratitude and faith building. This is not a time, Joshua, for you to yearn for the days when Moses was here. So God's just point blank telling him, Moses is dead. We're moving on. You're moving on. I want you to remember how I was with Moses because I'm going to be with you in the same way. I want you to remember how when there was no way, I parted a Red Sea through Moses. I want you to remember all of that. But I want you to remember it because I want you to have faith to lead this people. The death of your earthly expectations, the end of something in a worldly way that you've always counted on and can feel really scary to you might just be the beginning of the whole new moment of moving forward in your life. What, what I'm saying is that so often you come to these pivotal times and it's a Moses is dead type situation where it's like that, that I've always counted on that for my security and it's not there anymore. And now I'm going to count on God. See, he said, Moses, my servant is dead. And he said, he was speaking to Joshua, the aid to Moses. And in that verse where he speaks of Joshua being Moses's aid, the Lord never uses that. That phrase is never used of Joshua again, because he's now. God's man. When they move forward in the land, something marvelous, mysterious, almost mystical takes place. Look at verse 3. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I've given to you just as I promised to Moses. This is, this is, this is you, you can contemplate the the paradox of this for, for days, for the rest of your life, you could think about how marvelous this is that there are the meeting here of the past tense and the future tense. I have given the land and every place where you will step your foot, I have given to you. It's, it's you will, that's future, and I have given it to you. Wow. So the people are taking a step now in the present and another step in the future. And as they do, each time they are appropriating what God has, past tense, already given to them. It explains how God has a way of blessing you with every spiritual blessing in Christ and yet 
Not every part of your inheritance is manifest in your life yet. But as you step your foot, it is yours. This explains the meeting of the sovereignty of God and the responsiveness of his children. That yet there's a way in which God can be completely sovereign and he is at work bringing about his good will that only he can do. And yet as you step your foot, the power of God and his sovereign purposes are being released. And it's just, it's just, it's fantastic to think of that God partners with us in that way. You know, some people think of the Christian life as all about what I need to do for God in order so that he'll please me, but that's not it at all. The Christian life is God saves, God delivers, God heals, God glorifies, God, God is the one who does it all, but we're his children and he has made us co-laborers with Christ himself. Wow. There's a, there's a place at, at the Epcot uh, theme park in, in Florida, in Orlando. There's one of the exhibits where they have some interesting uh, things you can use your imagination. And one place, there's a floor and you can step on it. It's dark, but when you step on it, it lights up. And it's sort of like, it's like we, the light is already there. The energy is already there. The power is already there. It only lights up though when you step on it. I, I sort of think that way with, with the Christian life. There's, there's, there's God is the source. And yet there's some way in which you, you participate. In that same exhibit uh, area and imagination, there is a place where uh, there's a screen and the... Uh, the little cute dragon cartoon character figment on the screen and their musical instruments. And if you come and you wave your hands as if you are the conductor of an orchestra, as you move your hands, the instruments start playing. If you go faster, the tempo picks up. You're not playing anything. You're not making it happen, but you're participating with it. I, 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 this is the way the gospel works. So God saves, in fact, in the mystery of his grace. If you trace it back to its most radical root, Paul says, we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. But nobody more than Paul felt the urgency to preach the gospel so that those who are chosen before the foundation of the world will receive the gospel. What I'm saying is that, that like the words of my mouth could never save anybody, Right? You're, you're sharing the gospel with somebody. It couldn't save anybody. But there are people who will hear a word that comes out of my mouth or out of your mouth. And like stepping onto ground that lights up. Like, like, like it releases the very plan and power of God. That's why we do mission. It's not because we think it's all up to us or something like that. No, it's that we believe God has said that in Christ you have a spiritual dominion in the earth that has been restored to you, like what was promised to Adam. And every place that you step your foot, every place that I call you to go, every place that you minister the truth of the gospel, every place you sow compassionate love, all these places, you are, in a sense, taking new territory, but it's not you that takes it. It's, it's the power of God. The, the, the other principle from this is that there's no other way for Joshua to get to the next part of the promised land, except to fight the first battle. There was no getting to, to I or to Bethel or to the Southern, uh, uh, areas where they would do battle, certainly not up into the Northern region until the first Jericho. In fact, you could think of it like steps, steps one, two, three, four. Well, if you're here, you might be able to see two or three steps in front of you, but there's a point at which there's step 10 that you can't even see. You, you, until you've taken that mountain, you won't even be able to see the next mountain. 
That's why, beloved, it's in the kingdom, it's you take a step with God, you take another step with God, and there's stuff you hadn't even seen yet that God's going to show you next. Forward progress. And it's interesting to me that when he says, every place you step your foot, I've given you this land, the Hebrew is plural here. See, this is why we need to get a southern translation of the Bible. And it would have said, every place that y'all step your feet, I've already given it to y'all. That's what he's saying. Because if you are with Joshua, if you're with Yeshua, if you're with him and you're in him, then wherever he steps his foot, your foot's going and it's yours too. You get to keep on going. And here's, here's the thing. This image came to me. It's football season. And so th this is a prophetic image that I, it, it only football uh, fans get the full meaning of this, but I want to try to explain it to you. It's a principle in football called forward progress. When a runner has the ball and runs and then gets tackled, and as they tackle that runner, or same thing for a receiver who catches the ball and then starts trying to run, when that runner or receiver is tackled, Sometimes as being tackled, the, the, the opposed the defenders will push that runner backwards, backwards. But the rule in football is that wherever you made forward progress, however far you did get before they started pushing you back, once you've reached the maximum that you are going to reach on that play, that forward spot, no matter how much you're pushed backwards, when the play is over, the ref brings the ball back and he puts it down to the place of your forward progress. That's the new line of scrimmage. So what this means is that if there's a whole bunch of people that are tackling you and you're ganged up on and you're just trying to hold on for dear life and they start pushing you back it doesn't matter. You still get your forward progress. It could pick up a runner and carry the runner back 10 to 15 yards. It doesn't matter. It might not be pleasant to be carried by about five, 300 pound linemen. But however far you got at the end of the play, the ball goes back up there and you get your forward progress. It doesn't matter how hard you get tackled. Oh, man, you can get tackled hard. It doesn't matter if someone tackles you so hard that it throws you back and you're about to lose your breath when you hit the ground. You still get your forward progress. Somebody could tackle you so hard your helmet comes flying off and you're lying there and you're thinking, I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to get up again and your helmet's flown somewhere off. It doesn't matter. You could be lying there with a concussion, but you still get your forward progress. And here's the other thing about it in football that where if you make forward progress and you get past where you need to go in order to make a first down, you get it. If the, if the ball had to get to the 30 yard line in order to make a first down and get a fresh set of downs, if you make it just barely to that 30 yard line and then they push you all the way back to midfield, you still got the first down. And what's really cool in football is that if just the nose of the football crosses the goal line in the end zone, it's a touchdown no matter how hard your body got hit. You could come up there and just barely get the ball across and they knock you back five yards and still it's a touchdown. <laughs> what happens in the spiritual journey so often is that you're making progress in the spirit I'm talking about. I'm talking about you're growing in the things of God. I'm talking about you're, you're growing in your mission in the world. You're, you're advancing from, from the immaturities of the Christian life into more mature things. You're learning to trust God more. You're discovering more of the fruit of the spirit of love and joy and peace in your life. Spiritual progress, I'm talking about. Prayer that, that used to be more of a, of, a, of a burden has become more alive to you. You're growing. Your, 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 your love and desire to care and love for people and compassion around you. 
your, 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 your witness to others that's making an impact, all of it, spiritual growth I'm talking about, right? All that's part of what I think of the promised land. The promised land is not up in heaven. The promised land is a battleground. It's the kingdom of God here and now. It is, it is all of the promises of God that are yes and amen. It is the spiritual growth of your life, of taking new territory in this invisible kingdom. And what happens, I think, so often is that life hits us hard. I mean, it's, how, how, how much more of a feeling of being ganged up on and tackled for a loss, it feels like, is this whole pandemic. I mean, just the isolation, the loss, the fears, this, the pain, the sicknesses, the, I mean, on and the list goes on. It just feels like it's just pushed us back. And some, sometimes, and I've had these moments, you have too, sometimes it's like there's a tackle that comes so hard, it's like it comes from the blind side and it picks you up and knocks you down. And you can be lying there just trying to breathe. You know what I'm talking about. Just trying to breathe again. And something inside of you in those moments feels like, I have lost territory. And sometimes when it's been wearisome and hard and you've been knocked down, there's a huge temptation to just stay down and think, what's the point of this? I've made no progress at all. And I think the prophetic word God wants you to receive, beloved, is you have made more forward progress than you realize. And no setback, no big tackle, no being pushed back, no, no circumstantial setback can undo the spiritual progress that you've made. You might have been hit hard, but beloved, when you get back up, the ball goes back to your point of forward progress. You, you've grown more spiritually than you realize. There's more steel down in your soul than you realize. You've got some wisdom now that you didn't used to have. You have gifts in your life that have operated before, and you might feel like I'm not being used lately. Those gifts are not gone, and you don't pick back up in some distant place. You pick back up right where you have been. There are ways in which God has been using you in other relationships and ways that people's lives are being impacted through the love that you've shown them and you don't yet see it all manifesting in front of you. Don't give up. You've got forward progress. You might be praying for a wayward child. You might be trying to struggle your way through a very difficult relationship. You might be envisioning what God has for you in your life and it's not yet clear. And so you start wondering if maybe it's all for naught. And I think God wants to say, no, you just keep going because you get your forward progress. Let me tell you, it's just like football. You can win a football game by just getting three or four yards on a carry, getting three or four yards on a carry, getting three or four yards, got first down and do it again. And sometimes there's these huge, you know, passes down the field and it's fantastic and we love it, but you just keep going because you get your forward progress, move the football down the field and eventually you stretch it across and you've got a touchdown. And it's just something that I think God wants us to understand about this because Joshua came in and he took Jericho. But the very next battle was this battle of Ai, A-I. And they, they, they at first were defeated because it turns out there was sin in the camp. And the people lost their courage. They'd sent 3,000 men to go defeat the, the soldiers at Ai. And instead, they found themselves running for their lives. Joshua, he, he cleaned up the sin in the camp. And then the next time, the Lord said, go now. I've given I, the king, and the land into your hands. And Joshua sent 30,000 men. And they went and they took the city. And then they were able to keep going into Canaan. See, as soon as, as, soon as they had that loss, the text said Joshua got on his face down before the Ark of the Covenant. He just got on his face before the Lord and stayed there until dusk. And the Lord finally came to him and said, why are you on your face? Stand up. I'm giving you the city. Remember that you've already taken Jericho. You're in the promised land 
And they're going to be momentary setbacks. But do not let it cause you to despair. Forward progress. And then we pick up reading at verse 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Whatever you do, Joshua, if you want to take the land, I need you to stay in the word because the word of God is going to tell you who you are and tell you who I am. When you stay in the word, you're reminded of who you are as God's child. And you're reminded of who God is as a good, good father. You're reminded of all his promises. You're reminded of who you are. And so you're not like a ship that's being tossed back and forth. You know, isn't it interesting? Moses' call was so different than Joshua's. Remember Moses, he met God in a burning bush, this glorious sight. It would be that way with Moses. I mean, Moses, Moses didn't, he, he was so hesitant. He tried to find every excuse in the book to not go and be the mediator and the deliverer for God's people. And finally, Moses just said, well, how are they going to believe me? And God said, well, what's that in your hand? He said, it's a staff. He said, okay, throw it on the ground. He threw it on the ground and it became a snake. And then the Lord said, pick it up by the tail. And I was like, okay, he picked it up by the tail, became a, a, a stick again. And then, and, then, and then he said, take your hand, put it inside your cloak. He put it in, he pulled it out, it had become leprous. He said, put it back in your cloak, pulled it out, and it was healed. Moses started by meeting God through a sign and a wonder, and God started showing him signs and wonders, and he would deliver the people of Israel through signs and wonders, plagues against Egypt, and then Moses would lift up a staff, the Red Sea would part, it'd be miracle after miracle and signs and wonders would just be keep coming. That's, that's, that was the nature of Moses' call and the nature of Moses' ministry. And God, is, God has been and always will be a God of signs and wonders. He's a God of signs and wonders now. And, and there's no sense in which, oh, we don't need signs and wonders now. We need them just as much as we ever did. But it's interesting that Joshua doesn't have a conversation with God in the middle of a burning bush. But the Lord comes to him and says, don't let the word depart from you. Meditate on it day and night so you'll have strength and courage. The word that's going to keep you grounded, the word that's going to keep you directed. What he's saying here is that Joshua, you are different than Moses and this people is different than that people. I will still do signs and wonders. Oh, there are miracles in the promised land. The Jericho walls coming down, big miracle. There, I mean, there are going to be times in which God stops the earth from rotating just so the sun could stand still in the sky. There are going to be miracles. But what he's saying is that I want you to go in in the strength of the word. Because I want you to know, Joshua, I'm with you. And I don't need to show up with a sign and a wonder every day so that you'll remember I'm with you. This is a new day, a new level of maturity. In the old day, as soon as Moses was gone too long up on Mount Sinai, even though they'd seen the holiness of it all, they, they, got, they became uneasy and they built a, a golden calf to worship. Not, not, not so the taking of the promised land. I want you to know I'm with you, whether you're seeing me do something demonstrative or not. It's a growing up. They say that little babies do not, until between four and seven months, they do not understand that if mommy is here now and then she steps in the other room, that mommy still exists. This is called object permanence. They don't develop it until, until at the earliest about four months of age. You know what this means? This is crazy. This means that a three-month-old baby, precious little baby, okay, you got mommy here, 
And mommy carried that baby in her womb for nine months. Morning sicknesses, back aches, hot, and, and, and eating weird foods and, you know, and then have 14 hours of labor bringing that baby into the world. And it spent three months, already changed a thousand diapers, hadn't had a decent night's sleep in, in 90 days, feeds that baby, cares for that baby. And what it means, though, is that a three-month-old, after mommy puts the baby down into the, into the, the crib and steps out of the room, the baby's sitting there thinking, my mommy doesn't even exist anymore. <laughs> That's just crazy thought, isn't it? The three-month-old sitting there like, oh, no, I'm alone in the world. She, she just doesn't even exist anymore. You, you can step 10 feet away from a baby, and the baby thinks you don't even exist anymore. Unless I can see you with my own eyes doing something right now, unless I can feel some milk going in my tummy right now, as far as I'm concerned, you don't exist, mommy. <laughs> but if you grow up, you start realizing, you know, mommy can walk in another room and she still exists. And uh, she, she's only 10 feet away. She could, she could be with me in just a second like that. So you learn to trust and you learn to become secure because of object permanence, because things don't disappear just because I can't see it right now. Joshua, I want you to not depart from the word. Do not look to the left or the right. You stay right in the midst of this truth. And this truth will empower you and set you free. I will be supernaturally present with you. But I don't want you to get all worried if I step out of the room for 10 minutes. I don't want you to get worried just because you lost one battle at I. I don't want you to worry when the Gibeonites deceive you. I'm with you and you're making forward progress and you keep going. I want you to remember, just like I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you. I'm a faithful God. I'll never leave you. And you grow in the love of God and you recognize that about him. Stay in the truth if you want to take the promised land. So Joshua's name was originally Hosea. And Moses changed his name to Yahoshea, which is expressed as Yahshua, Yahshua, because Hosea means salvation. And Moses added to it Yah, as in Yahweh, the Lord, so that he changed his name to mean the Lord saves. Not just regular salvation, you don't save, not some other God, but the Lord, the God and Father of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. The Lord who appeared to Moses and said, my name is Yahweh. He changed his name to Yahoshea, Yeshua. And in Greek, the way that it is transliterated, Yeshua, it is the word Iesus which the way we say it is Jesus. Every place y'all step y'all's foot, every place Jesus steps his foot, Yeshua, your true Joshua, you are attached to Jesus. It is what Paul said we are to do to stay in step with the Holy Spirit. You are in a walk with God. And wherever he goes and he flows and he moves, you in Christ move with him. And so he's your general and he's taking the territory. If we could sit down and talk, we could share about setbacks in our lives over the last year and a half. You could talk about it, maybe things difficult in your family, health, losses, businesses, I mean, all of this, what a time it's been. But beloved, don't you dare give up now in Yeshua, in Joshua, in Jesus' name, I proclaim to you, you have made forward progress and you're going to keep making it. And that's the gospel.
There was a moment when the lights went out When death claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history There on the cross they made for sinners For every curse is blood atoned When fire breath and it was finished But now the end we could have known For the earth began to shake and the veil was torn What sacrifice was made As the heavens rolled Oh, 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 Jesus Dark There was a moment when the sky lit out A flash of light was breaking through When all was lost you crossed eternity The king of life was on the way. For in a dark One miraculous prayer We forever change Don't hit Jesus All hit Lord of heaven and earth All hit King Jesus Savior of the world oh, Let every knee come bow before the King of Kings Let every tongue confess that Oh,
I don't know what kind of tackle life has handed you. Uh, has it been more like five 300 pound linemen that have ganged up and just keep pushing you back and pushing you back and you're tired? Has it been like someone has just landed a blow on you, the helmet flew off and has knocked you back and taken your breath away? Whatever life has handed you, I want you to know in the spirit, God sees it and he wants you to see it. You've got your forward progress and you've come further than you realize. And so every time that uh, you get knocked down and you get back up, you get to go in the spirit I'm talking about back to where you were. There's more in you than you realize. And maybe you're with us today and you're just wondering about all of this and saying, I, I don't know for sure that I'm with Joshua. I'm not sure I'm with Jesus. How do I make sure of that? And here's what you do. It's so simple. A child, anyone can simply say, God, I know that I need you. Forgive my sin. Come into my heart and be my savior and be my Lord. Fill me with your spirit and your purposes so that I can walk all my days with you. I don't want to be on my own. I, I need you, God. And he comes into your life and you are in Christ. <laughs> and that's the promise of the gospel. Wherever y'all, you and Jesus, step your foot. I've given it to you. May the Lord God bless you and keep you and be kind and gracious to you and make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace today and forevermore. Amen.